gentlemen. Welcome to Luxbook Presents Virtual Lux, Episode 1. Today we are going to discuss new business ideas and solutions for the new millennial or the new normal. And I, Riddhi Doshi, editor of Luxbook, am extremely delighted to have with us on our panel today four supremely talented, amazing young women leaders who have business in their DNA, they all belong to business families, yet have carved a niche for themselves. So please let's welcome Amruda Nair, Director, Araya Hotels and Resorts, Karina Bajaj, Executive Director of Ka Hospitality, Kresha Bajaj, Creative Director of Kresha Bajaj, a fashion label, and Rachel Goenka, author, chef, and also the CEO and founder of Chocolate Spoon Company. Welcome ladies. Today I'm going to start my session with a little bit of a recap and I want to know that during the lockdown, which were really the most important takeaways, business takeaways uh, for each one of y'all, um, whether it was challenges and the lessons that you have learned from the challenges, I would like to hear that. So I think if you're able to see you know, plan along a timeline, it makes it much easier. So while, you know, the first efforts were to manage, you know, um, cash flows and work towards keeping things um, going, very soon it became uh, time for hard decisions. And I think that that's where, you know, after that, that I think business owners all want to do the right thing, even from a moral perspective. But, you know, beyond the minute it went beyond 60 days, then that line between, liquidity and solvency becomes very fine. So I think that was the, the biggest challenge. Hmm. Okay. And uh, Karina, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, I think just going on with what Amrita said, it um, is really, I mean, it's impossible for us as a hospitality industry to be working from home. And I think we learned um, very quickly because our brands and um, the main brands that that we have Hakkasan and Yawacha are luxury and we've never actually um, indulged in doing deliveries mm -hmm. and that's something that we had to kind of think quickly on our feet and see how do we want to kind of bring that experience to people's homes. Mm. Um, so that was the first for us for sure. Um, we brainstormed on a couple of different things we wanted to do. We also looked at how do we want to optimize our spaces within our operation. So um, we actually uh, launched both for Hakasan and Yawacha out of our Hakasan kitchen um, to ensure that, you know, we have our, all our team members in one space and um, ensure that we're optimizing cost. Um, so we had to do a couple of things like that. At the moment, we're actually looking at um, because it's not just about food and beverage for us. It's about the entire experience that we give when a customer comes to our restaurants. So how do we bring um, different experiences to people's homes? So we're actually just doing a lot of work on that right now in terms of like different home experiences that we can give that are funner and like more than just a delivery. Okay. Okay. And uh, Kresha, how, how about you? How are things in the fashion industry right now? Um, when you speak about challenges, you know, it's been extremely challenging. Um, as a brand, we only have one store in Mumbai and we had a lot of plans this year of, you know, uh, pop-ups and going, doing a lot of international shows as well. So obviously that came to a standstill and we are primarily a touch and feel brand. You know, we don't retail in any other store. We don't retail online. Uh, so because of that, when this happened, Happened, we literally had zero avenues of sale hmm. and a large part of what we do and the pieces we create you know cater to a bridal and a wedding clientele so you know it's really safe to say that we're wedding dependent designers and with this happening um, a huge chunk of the team that works in bridal in the bridal department it, it was a very stressful situation for them and the you know it left us in a big conundrum as to if and when any weddings would happen this year mm. um so that for us was you know the most challenging we have 150 people dependent solely on wedding clientele mm. um and when you know when you ask me about the lessons learned i also think that this has also been a positive time which has allowed us to really reflect 
um, and take time to do things that we normally wouldn't. So of course, right now we are focusing on finding a way to digitize the brand, which is really challenging because we like controlling the entire na narrative, you know, from the fragrance you get when you walk into the store to the bridal suite to the entire experience it is it, it's like a story it's like a journey that we want to take the client through so digitizing that process has again been another challenge but um what we've learned is you know it's been a struggle for content creation for example we're so used to having our perfect places to create this beautiful content i've had to use my sister as a model i've had to use myself as a model um, you know, I've also taken two and a half weeks to create a set by hand in one of our rooms to photograph the next collection hmm. because I don't have a photographer or an editor or this huge team that usually works. So learning to be self-sufficient has been a great learning from this, learning that we can, you know, do things in a much smaller way with the same impact. Um, I've learned to code a website. I have my embroidery creator who's learned how to do watercolor sketches. Um, and my brand head has learned how to edit videos. Nice. My graphic designer broke her laptop. So she's not had a laptop throughout quarantine. So she's been editing and creating content using multiple apps on her phone. Um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of also showed you crisis management and how to figure out how to get your stuff done one way or the other. Which, which I think is very important. And Rachel, even on the phone when we spoke, even you were telling me about how your business have, I mean, you guys have adopted or adapted to the new normal. So what has the journey been like for you, the crisis especially? But honestly, to start off with, it was really challenging to manage the customer perception. I think that was... Uh, a big one because there's there was so much of pure psychosis around COVID, uh, especially ordering in, you know, eating from any restaurant. People were just genuinely scared, thinking that you know um, we're we're going to probably contract this disease uh, if we order in. So it was uh, about creating a lot of communication and actually speaking to our customers, uh, putting out a lot of content on social media through mailers, um, things like that, you know, where we just sort of inform people that, A, you can't contract this virus through food, uh, the kind of steps that we were taking as far as delivery was concerned. Uh, another challenge that we faced was our supply chain was massively, massively affected. Mm -hmm. So we weren't getting a lot of ingredients and we actually had to tweak a lot of our menus to create menus within uh, what was available. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, so suddenly we just, like we're used to doing very, very creative food and uh, you can't get ingredients very easily right now. So, and a lot of the demand also has changed where people just want comfort food. And uh, I think the third big challenge that we faced was um, a lot of our employees decided to just sort of go home and go back to their hometowns. And although they were asked to stay put and we were providing food and accommodation to everybody, I think people obviously, you know, were feeling a lot more comfortable being home with their families. So uh, people left. So we were also uh, forced to operate with minimal staffing. Hmm. So, you know, I mean, uh, I think that sort of makes, uh, sort of teaches you to think on your feet and uh, how to overcome those things. And uh, luckily we've been doing fine. So can't complain. And obviously, like we have been talking about the new normal and how consumer behavior has changed. And obviously, accordingly, businesses will have to change as well. So I would want to know that how have your respective businesses changed? How has consumer behavior changed? And how have you adapted to the new normal? So what are the new plans, new business solutions, new technology, social media, everything so please give us all those details and perhaps i mean whoever wants to go first or rachel we can start with you okay so uh, to start off with as far as managing the company is concerned now uh, you know the entire management perspective has moved online it's moved to zoom calls it's moved to you know google meets or phone calls essentially and that's how we're basically managing the company right now um, as far as consumer behavior is concerned, what we really notice is that the way the ordering patterns of people also right now are more uh, towards comfort food. You know, we, we, uh, we never really had a mac and cheese on our menu before. And now we've had to sort of 
uh, put a mac and cheese and you know obviously we do our mac and cheese with like truffle just to make it a little more interesting and innovative but um, so we're sort of you know tweaking our delivery menus also to what the customers want we've seen burgers are moving massively we've actually created a new burger um, brand which uh, which is in collaboration with Swiggy so that's something that we've done during the lockdown and um, so we've been working on new products as well so I think just overall and then also you know uh, working on SOPs for reopening because I think come July uh, we're slowly going to start reopening and uh, uh, having those SOPs in place and training your staff uh, beforehand to make sure that they know what the safety norms are uh, that's been really important. In fact, Rachel, I'll come to that a little bit later, but let's have the others tell us what are they doing and how have they adapted to the new normal. Amruta, would you like to go? Yeah. So I think, you know, uh, going back to what uh, Krisha said, this this uh, need to adapt and be agile. I think, the, you know, for me, the, the, the biggest lesson also is when, when, when we're hiring going forward, you're going to want um, your team members and leaders who, who have that ability to adapt. And um, I have to be you know, very grateful for um, our teams, whether it's been at the restaurant um, or in, um, at our um, resort, um, you know, who, who left their families at home, still came in, stayed in house, even though they weren't any guests and you know, basically secured the asset, which is in itself quite a task. Um, and so I think that, you know, this, this building in what the, the silver lining, I suppose, is this, this building in of that flexibility, um, which, you know, we, you always plan for multiple scenarios, but now it's testing the model. So um, I think hiring for agility is certainly one of those things. Um, going digital going forward, um, we've looked at going contactless in every which way. So um, from the check-in process, so other than that final verification step which still needs to be manual um, when we send out um, the initial survey to our to our guests who are looking to check in at an Araya hotel you know normally we'd send like a personalization menu so you you know so you can um, personalize your stay so along with that we'd actually do the whole ID process and all of that online also so I think going forward this whole side of uh, data protection uh, you know uh, in terms of even the, the payment methods and the gateways that we're using, all of that data security is all going to be also extremely important. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in terms of um, going digital, I think that there's, there's a lot of uh, the onus then lies on, um, on you as a brand also uh, in terms of how you protect that data. So I think and that's going to be something that's critical. And that's added responsibility, right? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I remember, Amrita, when we were talking on the phone, you also mentioned that uh, like people think that if the resorts, hotels, or restaurants are not going to be functioning at 100% occupancy, the overheads might be lesser. But that's not really the case. So could you elaborate on that a little bit? Sorry, could you repeat the question, Radhi? Uh, uh, when we were talking on the phone, you said yes. that the number of people or the staff to guest ratio is in fact going to be affected quite a bit. Uh, so can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so I think when it comes to, to manpower planning, um, if you know, you'll also limit the number of interactions. So our, um, I have a restaurant in Malta at the moment and we are back to, um, you know, doing, we're at 50% capacity. So when we were training our staff to interact with guests, we were limiting, you know, the number of interactions. So you actually train to, you know, so instead of going to, to the guests for different courses, you take all your orders up front, you limit the number of times you, so, you know, th th that aspect has changed. So I think the way we plan also going forward will be different in terms of the, the employee to guest ratio. But I think, um, you know, we're also looking at other uh, aspects like completely contactless room service. Mm. So, you know, so, so we'll have to, you know, really, uh, you know, a lot of hotels are going to eliminate having buffets uh, going forward. So, you know, how do you still give that, that uh, experience of, say, a live counter, which was, you know, sort of the, you know, the exciting element of um, a breakfast display and, and still be able to deliver that, um, that experience um, at the resort. So those are the aspects that we're looking at. Uh, which make it much trickier. So I think, you know, uh, going back to the earlier point in terms of agility, 
um, you know, multitasking. Um, the one good thing about uh, this, the lesson has been also the team has learned to adapt and take over different departments. So again, um, you know, so you're able to to also work in a more cohesive manner. So there, are, I think there are lots of lessons learned in this whole process that will will help us um, also be a leaner, uh, have a leaner process, um, and 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 be more agile. Okay. Uh, Karina, I remember you were telling me about how you plan to curate experiences at home. So can you talk a little about that and where did that idea come from? Yeah, um, so I think one thing we've realized is that we don't actually obviously know the future and how it's going to be going forward. And, and one thing we've kept in mind is that we have to keep evolving our dining experiences as time progresses and as we go. Um, so what we've um, recently launched at Chin Chin is we've basically, we make a lot of, we make all our pasta fresh in-house. So we've done some DIY fresh pasta kits. Um, we had like a huge, uh, I mean, our guests really craved our pizza. So we were thinking, how can we do this in a way that you know they can have it whenever they want so we've actually um made them and we've frozen them as well and we're retailing them in that sense so people can just buy a bunch and keep it in their freezer and make them as and when they want um we're also doing that with our lasagna trays. We've done a few um, Zoom calls on requests of our guests in terms of like dim sum making uh, classes for like birthdays or, you know, just different things to kind of keep our guests engaged with us. Um, from a long time, uh, long term perspective, we are looking at doing a lot of things at home, which, as I mentioned to you before, is very new to us because we've never actually indulged in that before. Um, but we're looking at how do we make this fun? So, um, for example, at Chin Chin, we have um, this festival that we celebrate every year, which is called the Lemon Festa. And we actually just um, celebrate the spirit of Italy and the Amalfi Coast when it's like in bloom. And um, we actually collaborated with Kresha last year on this. And what we did is we created a menu that was all inspired by Amalfi lemons. And we decorated our entire restaurant with wisteria and um, just like basically summer so the idea is if someone wants to do that for their birthday or for their um anniversary or just for like a girl's dinner where we get that entire menu to their home and like decorate the entire living room and basically transport them to Italy um, or for example with uh, Hakkasan we've always been kind of famous for and our guests really love the signature Peking duck so how can we basically get that experience to your home where we get um, the duck we get our chef to carve it in front of you with the entire champagne and caviar experience so how do we really bring luxury home right so we get the our entire team to come to you and actually do the table setup with the Hakkasan dishes and with the chopstick and the sake and the champagne. Um, because for us, it can't just be packed up into a box. It has to be larger than life because that's what happens when you come to the restaurant. Um, and also it's just, just smaller things, like we've started retailing our sauces, we're focusing on gift hampers, even putting set experiences um, in our delivery menu. So, you know, you have that entire experience at your home. So yeah, a lot of things that we've never had to do before, but I think it's been fun. And um, just to take um, on from what Amrita said as well, I think we've really learned how to be a little more self-sufficient because we've had like uh, service guys actually on the road delivering to mm. people. We've had like a SCM team having to do like cost controllers job. And we've just like, we've always been dependent on agencies when it comes to like marketing, but we've learned how to do a lot of things in house, which I think has been really amazing um, and something that we hope to capitalize on going forward. And uh, Kresha, how are things at your store? You told me that you guys have just started opening up. So how has it been like there? And what are you planning to do? What are going to be your sanitization and, uh, you know, other so social distancing protocols? Um, so right now, in terms of the biggest change, of course, as I mentioned, it's our virtual consultations that we're doing. Uh, we have opened the store, um, but we haven't let anyone come in as yet. We are just using it as a space where my team um, can show the clients different outfits, try it on, uh, take them through the collection. But once we do start letting people um, come in for appointments, we will be doing it by appointment only. Um, and usually how the store works is it's broken up into two floors. We have a prep area, which is the ground floor. 
and a bridal suite on the first floor. And the bridal suite is made like a living room. Um, it's meant to make the bride and her entire family feel very special. So there's someone with, who comes with a menu of what you can eat and what you can drink and sit around this beautiful intimate space with revealed curtains where the bride can change, you know, her outfits and the curtains just reveal. So she doesn't really have to move in and out of spaces. Um, and we've always had one bride in at a time, but now we would have to... Um, you know, have that practice for the entire store where we would only allow one bride or one bridal family at a certain time. Of course, we've also put in rules of not letting anyone um, in above the age of 60, as well as not having any of our employees who are above the age of 60. Um, you know, then all the basic processes, which is um, checking temperature three times a day, sanitizing washing hands before and after every appointment, sanitizing all the surfaces, uh, using an oximeter. And another thing that we are enforcing is we get an idea of what our client wants to see before they come in. Okay. So, um, you know, the first and second part of what they're liking, what they're not liking is done virtually. And then we set aside certain pieces that they know that they would like to try. And say, for example, we have two brides coming in and they both want to try a similar piece. We would, um, you know, separate their appointments by a week. Hmm. Because right now, I'm still not sure if something's come out about how long a virus can last on cloth. But I know on plastic and glass, it's four days and a week. Um, respectively and because we use a lot of embroidery and beading we want to set aside that you know gap between two trials that um, clients do and apart from that in terms of changes in social media or strategy or how we decide to go forward to be honest there won't really be many changes in that because we've always practiced um, or we've always done one to two collections maximum in a year um, and that has always been a conscious decision because, you know, as a brand, we always want to see what, how we can be more sustainable. And as bridal, as a bridal brand, of course, we do use fabrics such as silk and we do use beading and we do use sequins. But what we do focus on is investment pieces um, and slow fashion and pieces that have the most intricate, beautiful craftsmanship that can last you through generations um, and we really, you know, we really focus on slow fashion and really take the time to create every single piece. So there is never two of one piece in the store. Um, it's one piece is made over a span of three to six months. Some pieces even take 11 months to create. Um, so in that way, we have always been a very slow brand. And I think that will continue. And I feel like that's how the world is moving, which is amazing. Um, I really celebrated when Gucci mentioned that they were going to move to only launching two collections a year. Hmm. Um, you know, yeah. Keisha, such stringent uh, social distancing or sanitization process, will that negatively affect your business? And if it will, then what do you plan to do about that? You know, in terms of negatively affect, I feel maybe I, I might have a client who wants to come in this week and I, you know, we might have to tell her that I'm sorry, we don't have an appointment this week and you might have to come next week and we, we might lose the client. Um, but I think today people want to go to brands they trust, you know, brands they trust, brands that are honest. Um, I don't think anyone wants to go to someone that they don't really know. It could be your vegetable vendor, it could be your doctor or your jewel or anyone. You want to go to someone you're used to and you know they're completely transparent and you know exactly what their, you know, processes and procedures are. So I feel that maybe, you know, of course, there's a chance that you could lose out on a client or an order. Um, but it's better to be safe than sorry. And at the end, it's not only the customers who, you know, we want to protect, but it's also my team. Mm. Um, and that kind of comes in hand in hand to just, you know, practice safety measures. Yeah, that makes sense. Rachel, what do you think about it? Like, so what are the sanitization, social distancing process that you will have to implement? And uh, how, I mean, obviously there are going to be a few challenges, but what will those challenges be? And would it affect revenues? Uh, so to start off with, it's definitely going to affect revenues because uh, we're going to have to operate at a 50% capacity. 
uh, all uh, F and D. And, um, you know, and automatically you'll have to reduce staffing because of that. So you'll have to keep rotating your staff or re-employ, retrain your staff to either, either be order takers or delivery riders. Um, but as far as uh, the safety and hygiene standards are concerned, uh, I think all of us in this business actually do, do take hygiene very, very seriously. This is pre-COVID. Now, post-COVID, it's just going to be on another level, you know, where you're talking about your services, uh, surfaces being sanitized on a regular basis. Um, uh, the tables and stuff are going to be sanitized in, uh, in between each uh, course, if not in between each seating. Um, the, uh, your uh, people in the kitchen are going to be wearing masks. They're going to be we uh, wearing visors. They won't be allowed outside the staff quarters with their uniforms on. So people have to come in, change into their uniforms. Uh, same with shoes. So I think in that sense, there's going to be a very stringent protocol. But at the same time, we have to be mindful that, you know, we are in the hospitality business. And this is about um, making fee people feel invited and welcome. So you can't have this environment of, you know, people in sort of hazmat suits and uh, coming across as extremely intimidating or like you're in a hospital, dining in a hospital, essentially. So uh, you have to also balance um, safety with, um, you know, being an inviting um, environment for people. And so, how do you plan to do that? How do you plan to strike that balance? So I think I don't, I definitely don't think you can take, uh, you know, the, the people part of it out completely. So, uh, and, I mean, we, a lot of us go to restaurants, we love to talk to our servers, find out what recommendations are. A lot of us like to, you know, sort of, uh, customize our meal, somebody's allergic to something or somebody doesn't like a particular ingredient. So, you know, those conversations always end up, you end up having those conversations with your server. But I think now going forward, uh, I definitely, um, I, what, what, we, what we are doing rather is we're going to be having QR codes on our table. So when you come into the restaurant, you can immediately scan your QR code, the menu pops up. Uh, we're encouraging our guests to actually look at the menu before they come in and uh, decide what they want to order. They can call the restaurant in advance if there are any allergies or, you know, any specifications. So the kitchen is already informed about that. So, um, you know, you're already limiting the amount of uh, conversation that you're having with, you know, uh, um, Amrita actually touched up on this point as well. You're limiting the, uh, the amount of conversation that happens and contact that happens between a server and a guest. So uh, we've also integrated our online um, our websites as well. So we've got a payment gateway on our websites. We've upgraded those so people can order directly from our websites too. Karina, even you have launched a website, right? Yeah, so we're actually going to be launching it soon. I'm working on it right now where we can, um, where you can place your order directly on our website and uh, we will get it delivered to you at home. Um, and uh, so we've actually um, started our operations in Bangalore and Calcutta uh, because we, we've been allowed to since uh, more than a week now. And we only started it a few days ago because we wanted to see how um, everything was panning out. Uh, we, what we've seen is a lot of our regular guests have actually come back to us, which has been amazing and really reinforcing. Um, um, going on from what Rachel said, we also have uh, put into place our QR code. So basically people can just scan that. You don't need to touch the menu. Um, even in terms of payment, we have a payment bitly link over there. We, whenever we make your reservation, we send you the menu in advance. Another thing that we've done is we've actually, we um, felt the need to kind of get assistance as well from um, a medical professional. So we actually tied up with Cube Health, where uh, what they do is that they um, conduct tests for all our team members. So it's uh, both a physical test and uh, a call test as well. And the great part of it is that they have a dashboard and they keep in constant uh, touch with the team members. So on a daily basis, the team members have to put in their temperature and whether they feel um, sick of any sort and they've tied up with the doctor in all the cities so we're present in Bombay, Bangalore and Calcutta um, and uh, we work really closely with them and I think it's great because they have a lot of knowledge and uh, they make the team more importantly feel um, safe so I so that has really helped and uh, what we've done is we have 
limited manpower right now a lot of people have gone back to their villages so to ensure that everyone gets an opportunity we are doing weekly rotas so basically we give everyone a chance to work at the restaurant and also ensure that we have two batches actually so in for example in bangalore we give accommodation to our team members so the team members who stay um, in our accommodation is one batch and then the ones who don't is another batch so for example if for any reason something happens to one of the team members then we have a full other set of team members ready that we can just put into place okay and uh, amrita you were telling me that you had to in fact invest in hygiene and sanitization machines and obviously being a hotel or a resort you have to be a lot more careful so what are going to be those processes and procedures at your resort so i think that you know the one good thing um is that it- Uh, like um, Krisha mentioned earlier, that people will opt to go for branded players because they there's a there's an assurance that there's going to be a certain um, protocol that is going to be followed. Um, in our case, the from a housekeeping perspective, the process was all, always there, but it it's been amplified now. And I think it's just going to be a a norm, just like like how we adopted safety measures. Um, you know, after twenty six eleven, it's it's part of your process. There's an additional cost to that element. which i think is another whole discussion because as luxury players you also want to hold on to your positioning from a price perspective so i think holding on to to that you know uh, price positioning is is just as critical um and then that allows you to continue to offer the experiences like what everyone else was sharing so um so the first thing i would you know uh would you know, want to say is that while you have to find a way to absorb um all the additional cost elements that the 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 enhanced safety protocols have to bring in um you know one has to be conscious of even being able to still demand um so you can't really cut out the frill if you're mm-hmm. in the luxury space um what we've looked at from from um on on site is everything from a uv light um to to you know to sanitize items like mobiles and keys um your luggage when you arrive um even your room once it's been sanitized we've actually developed a seal so you know that no one else has entered that room for, since the cleaning the last cleaning process um we've got uh, we've already, uh, always adopted wa- uh, wall mounted dispensers but now we've got um a custom blend turmeric based hand soap that's been made um, especially for us so you know i think there's lots of these different uh, things that you can do on site but i think the most critical thing will be is that you maintain your standards because that's what your guest is looking um you know for in terms of quality assurance and safety assurance and and not uh, succumb to this need to to drop rates um just to to bring in business because i don't think that's going to help anyone okay uh, that makes sense and going forward uh, how soon do you think we'll be back to normal or back to say pre covid revenue days what do you guys think so i think with with um, in in at least in the hotel space in scenarios that we'd seen in the past um like 911 and sars um you know it was incident based or just a health hazard i think in this case there's a double whammy of there being a health hazard as well as an economic impact so while um you know we're hopeful that the domestic market will pick up to begin with um because of all this initial pent up demand um whether that's sustainable is the question you see um your your baby boomer segment is the one that's willing to pay a premium for luxury and if they're the ones who are at high risk the question is uh you know maybe you'll have families that that go on 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 initial breaks just to get get out of their homes but whether that's going to continue for an extended period of time we don't know so i think the trickiest thing about this particular uh, pandemic has been the fact that you know there's been waves um and so even while you see that um in china and korea which have, who've had a 2 3 month um you know the 2 3 months ahead of us um you see second waves now Mm-hmm. So so I think that's the tricky part to be able to balance that out. Okay. Uh, Rachel. So as far as uh, increased revenues go I I really think it you know it all depends also on negotiations with landlords right now depending on the kind of rent relief that uh, we're going to receive 
I don't see, uh, I mean, the government, honestly, I've felt has had, you know, uh, there's been no apathy at all as far as the government is concerned because we've gotten zero relief from them. Uh, technically, the ESIC was supposed to be used for a pandemic like this, and they're sitting on about 84,000 crore of, uh, you know, funds in reserve right now, and uh, that hasn't been tapped into. So I think in that sense, we've been pretty uh, disappointed. But so now it's just completely self-sustainable, right? I think what we have to do is uh, increase revenue streams uh, within the entire the existing capacity that we have. You know, you're not going to be uh, seeing people spending more money right now uh, as business owners. So, I mean, what we've been doing is we've been doing DIY kits. We've been doing dessert boxes from Sassy Teaspoon and customized dessert boxes. So, you know, even uh, people can um, give them to people. So, we've got like a wish you were here box. We've got an indulgence box, which we've just curated from existing products that we have. Uh, like, I, like I mentioned earlier, we've actually tweaked our menus massively. So uh, more sort of user friendly, more comfort food. And uh, just in general, like a lot of content creation happening right now, which I think eventually is going to help uh, increase revenues. Because if you're a little uh, more careful right now with how much money you're spending, uh, once people start getting out, and I think people are going to be getting out in smaller groups to start off with, um, it's going to depend also on uh, what people's living situations are. So people who live with elderly parents, for example, they might be a lot more careful about stepping out. Younger people who live in more sort of nuclear families, they might be more prone to stepping out. So uh, I think it's just going to be a matter of, you know, how things pan out in the next couple of months. Uh, Karina, Tresha, any thoughts? And then maybe after that, uh, I'll request the audience to send us questions like via chat and we can address those. Karina, you wanna go? Should I go? You can. Um, okay, so to tell you really honestly, I'm very confused about um, when things are going to normalize, at least in luxury fashion, because I've been reading a lot about it. And of course, we can't compare ourselves as an you know, Indian luxury uh, brand to what is happening with luxury in other parts of the world um but i do you know okay so i read this article i think last month in new indian express where they mentioned that it's going to take four to six months um for the luxury market to normalize and especially during the festive season um and at the same time i've read articles about there being a lot of revenge buying mm. so i do see a huge section of revenge buying happening but then it falling again to a huge amount because a lot of people have you know insecurities with their jobs and what's going to happen um but what we've experienced currently is three kinds of brides the first bride who's decided not to have her wedding to get married at home with a very very intimate audience and wear a piece that's handed down from her mother or a grandmother beautiful um you know piece that she's inherited. Um, the second kind of bride who is following the same process, but is planning on having a really big function once this is over. And the third kind of bride um, who initially came with a much smaller budget. I mean, the budget is never small, but comparatively a much smaller budget. Um, and the same bride who's come back and the budget has literally multiplied by five. And it was, it was a little confusing initially and she said you know i don't i don't have this massive location i don't have logistics i don't have um catering i don't have to do anything else i had 300 people attending and now i have 1500 people attending virtually the mandap is being set up in my living room my masi is doing the decor all the attention is going to be on me and my husband and what i'm wearing and you know what we're wearing so i want the most grand outfit um you can give me so we've actually seen a lot of inquiries go up for the love story lenga which is something we create, which has, you know, the entire story of the bride and groom embroidered on it. So, yeah, so that's why I'm still not 100% sure on the direction it's going to take with luxury fashion just as yet. Karina, your thoughts on it? 
Um, so basically, I feel for at least a couple of months. So I'll give you the example of Calcutta and Bangalore. As I said, a lot of our regular guests have started to come back, um, but they are coming in smaller groups. And also as um, brands, we have restricted groups of above six people um, and we are at 50% occupancy as well. And that's not going to end anytime soon. So I mean, what we hope for is at least to go back to the kind of revenues we were seeing before by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think realistically, that is when it will happen. However, having said that, there will be different revenue channels now. So including delivery or including catering or home experiences. So even when I say going back to those numbers, I mean, including these things, which we didn't possibly have before. And then I think hopefully by next year, that will kind of get added on. But uh, for me, from a long term perspective, I am seeing it till the end of the year. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, audience, uh, everyone who's joined us, please ask your questions. It's time to take questions now. We can take them on chat. So if you could type in. So here we have uh, Many international f and outlets are getting creative to maintain social distancing. Some have installed special interior setups like glass, plastic barriers, or are using mannequins to fill the tables. Is something like that expected in Indian f and industry? And are these going to be for the time being or will it become a part of people's dine-out lifestyles? Karina, Rachel. Karina, do you want to take this? Because I definitely don't see this happening in any of my places. Um, I think the only like nice thing out of that would be like I could collaborate with Kresha and do something fun with her from a fashion perspective. But I think apart from that, no, I, I don't think we would ever do something like that. We already have to kind of um, operate at 50% occupancy. And I mean, the entire experience of going out is being with someone. And it, of course, you maintain that distance, but putting barriers between that just seems so clinical. And it's not something that we would go and do at all. You know, it's also I not part of our Indian culture, I feel, you know, I mean, our, our culture is very sort of family oriented, but we're very used to sort of going out in groups. So I, I don't see that. It's just such a disconnect also to me. Okay. Really, we we've done that in in Araya and Palampur. Um, we have rearranged the furniture even within the, um, the lobby and the rooms. Um, so even within the room, you have that distance. But I think that's primarily more in in terms of keeping distance between um, seat different various seatings. Um, we've got a restaurant in Malta that's currently open, and again they've mandated a two feet distance between tables. So, but it's it's been more about rearranging it, um, and then you you know uh, rather than than replacing it with barriers. Right. So basically, no dining with teddy bears or mannequins. <laughs> <in India. laughs> okay, we have another question. Uh, this is from Anshu. Do you anticipate that experiences will become more important than just doing something? Um, at least from the hotel space, what we've seen a lot more reaction um, to from our social media posts has been towards anything to do with wellness. Um, so not necessarily spa, interestingly, but wellness in general. So, you know, yoga spaces, um, immunity boosting drinks, um, you know, that angle. So at least with the resort, we've actually had people write to us, even though the, the resort's currently closed until the Marshall's borders open. Um, we've had people respond to our social media posts asking when we'll open because they're reacting to um, all the, the posts about sustainable practices and, and wellness practices. So I think that that's really what people are willing to, um, to pay a premium for. Okay. Do we have any more questions from our audiences? Because we will, we plan to wrap up in the next four to five minutes. So any more questions? Okay, I think maybe someone will type in. Until then, any last thoughts, uh, guys? Uh, what would you tell people who are new in the hospitality, fashion, and f and industry? What should they do to adapt to the new normal? Who wants to go first? You can start, Hachel. Um, I think uh, especially for people who have either just gotten into this business before 
the lockdown or who are planning on getting into this business, I think uh, it's a matter of sort of scaling down uh, and, and just having a sort of, you know, a short term plan with a long term vision, because in order to actually sustain this business and stay in this business, uh, right now, you just need to sort of, you know, cut your costs as much as possible, uh, keep safety in mind. Uh, a lot of the things that we discussed today, uh, you know, that sort of has to take precedent over everything else. And of course, you can't forget the whole, uh, you know, customer satisfaction as well, because that's fundamentally why we are in this industry. Uh, it, it is for customer satisfaction and give them the best experience in terms of food and service. And, uh, you know, so I think um, sort of keep your head up about those things and, you um, have a plan A and plan B and a plan C in place. And, you know, I mean, hopefully a vaccine will come out early next year. So we're all hoping and praying that this will go back to some sort of normal soon. Okay. Uh, I, sorry, Rachel, you have a question. Uh, and that's, do you think dining in home with curated dinner will become an option? I, I mean... I think that's, I mean, that's something that we are looking to do as well, where, you know, something as simple as, say, a, a date night actually creating a date night experience at home. Um, and I think this is something that a lot of places will offer, especially, uh, you know, more of sort of the higher end brands. I mean, Karina also touched up uh, on this. So uh, taking that experience home where you can, you know, where you bring in a chef, you have your servers and you create either whether it's for a family or whether it's a two person thing, uh, because, you know, I mean, there might be older people who don't want to step out that are still part of a family. There might be kids that don't want to, or parents aren't comfortable taking their kids out. So this is something that you can definitely bring home and bring that experience home. Okay. Um, Amrita, Karina, Kesha. I think from a, from a business model perspective, um, you know, going back to what we started with, you know, building in flexibility, being agile, re-looking at processes um, and, you know, cut, you know, trying to not cut out the frills, but being as lean as possible. That's, that's really the, the trick, um, maintaining price points. So I think if someone's looking to, to start something new, um, I'd certainly look at a business model where you've got multiple revenue streams and you're not dependent on a single market um, to give you that flexibility. Um, and I think this, the, you know, going back to what I was talking about earlier, um, maintaining your positioning and price points and not diluting the brand. I think that's the the biggest uh, you know uh, struggle for luxury players and and um, in India hopefully the consumer also will be willing to pay that premium for Indian products um, going forward uh, if, and and so you know hopefully this whole um, sense of of supporting local businesses um, you know uh, support go, traveling within India um, will become something that catches on and I certainly hope so. Okay, uh, Kresha, there's a question for you. Your brand revolves around creating an experience around your clients, dealing with the COVID constraints. How would you plan to do so? Um, so to be honest, that is something that we are, of course, actively figuring out. Uh, we have made some way with the kind of virtual consultations we're doing. So, okay, to make this short and concise we operate a little differently um i know a lot of luxury brands keep talking about uh, you know that we are the designer you you come get what we design and you're coming to us because of that and we're not tailors and we're not fixers um i have a little bit of a different belief i feel a person comes to you to a designer to get something designed for them for their body type for um their skin tone, their undertone. So the biggest chunk of the process that happens, apart from the experience of the fragrance and the menu and um, all of that, is sitting with the client and understanding what works for them. You know, you I might have a client who's come in and said, I, I want to wear red. Um, and she leaves, where, you know, taking an outfit of the color that she probably never wanted. And the reason for this is we do a lot of color theory. We focus a lot on anatomy, what looks good on your body, on your undertone, what photographs well. So Karina and me might be a similar skin tone, but the color of pink that works on me and the color of pink that works on her are two completely different things based on our undertone. She is olive and I'm beige. Um, so that was the biggest, you know, part of the experience and how we would give the client what would work best on them. 
so we've been doing things like making our client you know on virtually pick out a bunch of colors we actually had a client uh, yesterday or the day before who and we ended up doing their um, color curation process through her father's shirt he had this really pretty baby pink shirt that he wears to office and we told him get outside your comfort zone you know pick up clothes from other people in your house and and try them on and that's how we kind of did her final selection um so that's how we're trying to kind of get that experience to them but of course we haven't been able to digitize the you know actual service and the menu and the fragrance um that we offer but another thing we're trying to do and this is very tough and it's also extremely um it's not so feasible is doing uh, augmented reality and you've seen this become such a trend even on instagram with the ar filters really find you know trying to find a way where a client can step back and look at the video screen and actually swipe and try on multiple lengas or multiple outfits um so fingers crossed that that happens and it's possible soon but yeah this is what we're doing right now okay and this is a trick question and i guess we will end with it uh, so we heard that fab india has sacked 4500 people and sabia has decided to shut down i don't know where uh, that news is out but will we see a lot of uh, uh, fashion or established players whether it's hotels or fashion labels or or uh, restaurants uh, are we seeing a lot of it, uh, these being shut down in the near future do you think that will happen all of y'all um unfortunately i definitely think there are going to be some casualties um you know it especially with hospitality and i guess the same is with uh, fashion as well it's uh, you know we haven't like i said we haven't gotten any relief as far as uh, rentals are concerned as far as wages are concerned and if uh, you know companies have to take a step back and say that you know for survival it's best that we uh, shut down uh, that that's probably the best thing for them at that point of time so um let let's hope there aren't too many casualties but uh, the way we've seen things go that you know we've already seen a bunch of restaurants at least some outlets shut down and and it's sad to see that so let's hope there aren't too many more let let's hope so uh, amrita kresha but i think i mean especially when it comes to um hotel, the hotel business where you you know substantial portion of your your cost structure is payroll uh, unfortunately you know you're, you're not able to carry that for more than two months so i think that's where it's hurt if you were allowed to um you know to to bring in other sources of revenue in 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 for a lot of the hotels you you haven't been allowed to operate so you know no long stay no quarantine no take away you know so then it's it, it's you know with zero income um but there are very few businesses that can survive and you know without customers you're not going to be able to do so so um so i think that unfortunately yes you would see um a lot of casualties in in the hospitality space um only because of the extended deadline i think if it was if it was a month a month and a half it would have been still sustainable but unfortunately you know more than 60 days most businesses don't have that kind of reserve karina yeah i mean um i i completely agree with everything that they have said uh i think we've really tried and i say we i mean as the hospitality industry to really hold on as much as we can and i think every day has been um difficult and i think everyone's really tried to like put themselves out there with starting with deliveries or doing anything like gift vouchers and rai has been a great platform to you know really support um all kinds of restaurants and keep like the motivation high but unfortunately the fnb industry and our uh balance sheets have a very um low profit margin and it's it's slim and it's not like other like other industries so if you can't maintain that for a couple of months and you don't have the cash reserves and it makes the most obvious sense to shut down the business but i think um there's also some sort of like addiction when it comes to fnb and people who are into it they really love it so i think that even if you do have to take a smart like a hard call they will kind of come back hopefully and they will learn from it and do something that suits that 
you know, that time. So I think you just learn from it. And then if you want to be in the industry, you will come back somehow. So I think that's a positive out of it. Fingers crossed. Keisha? Um, I mean, it's a different industry, but it's also really similar to what everyone was talking about. Uh, it's been very tough and it's been very tough for a lot of fashion houses and for a lot of brands, you know, if you just have to calculate a minimum of how many people are required to make one garment. Um, you don't think about that when you're buying a top or when you're buying a dress, you know, how many hands have been involved, how many carriers have been involved. So usually fashion houses, you know, employ a lot of people and it becomes really difficult in these kind of situations. And I think going forward, only those would really survive who are making a quality product. It's like, I don't think there's time for fast fashion anymore. People are really going to be thinking about, you know, what they're going to spend money on. Frivolous purchases are really going to move away and people are going to want to get something that is an investment. Uh, so I think a fashion house that has been able to sustain through this really difficult time, as well as um, is creating a product that is a need or that's fulfilling a particular, you know, a particular thing that a person, a, sorry, a, some particular thing that a person needs. Um, will be able to really come out of this okay. but fashion as a it, it's tough it looks really like beautiful and luxurious and it looks like a very you know those jobs you see like on tv and in these shows and read about it's it's nothing like that so so basically consumers uh, now it's on y'all so please buy local support local be a little more mindful about what you guys need and spend in India and I also hope that the government takes notice and also helps all kinds of different luxury industries and gives some tax relaxations a GST or incentives so yeah that, that's what we all can hope for and in the meanwhile uh, thank you thank you for joining us uh, the panel is us. really interesting thank you. so and I hope you guys keep innovating and hope to see you all soon and thank you viewers, thank you for joining us. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.